So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse number 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Christmas is over. All right, yeah, because of the busyness of, this, of our lives and so forth, all of us have a few of these little last-minute get-togethers, you know, out of, with the out-of-town relatives and that kind of stuff. But basically, Christmas is over. For the last month, everyone has been running at a breakneck pace, trying to get the house decorated, the presents bought and wrapped, the food prepared, and then attending holiday get-togethers that seem like there's no end to them. And now, you sit here completely exhausted from all of the celebration of the holiday. And all that you worked for and all that you planned for is done. And the only thing left to do is to pack it all away until next year. For some, other than the impossible credit card bill that you'll face in next month, the season had no meaning. I had someone wish me this week, someone that I did not know, wish me a happy winter break, whatever that is. <laughs> Those people miss Christmas altogether. For many in the country, they recognize that putting an X in the point of Christ to shorten the word Christmas with an X in there, Xmas, is, doesn't just abbreviate the spelling, it eliminates the reason for celebration. They realize that Jesus coming to this earth was special, and they, to a varying degree of success, try not to let commercialism run over the holiday. Churches across the country experience at least some increase in attendance. And in many of the homes of these people who are trying to not let Christmas get overrun, nativity scenes are on display. But Christmas is over. And people who recognize the birth of Jesus Christ as being special start packing away their Christmas decorations. Along with the stockings, the garland, and those funky ornaments made out of popsicle sticks, the manger is packaged away. They have celebrated the birth of Christ, and now that's that. It's done. It's over. And they pack him away and will repeat the whole sequence this time next year. And to do that is to have missed Christmas altogether. To celebrate the birth of Christ as merely an event is to misunderstand it completely. For beyond the manger is a cross. You know, the early church was not ignorant of the facts of Christ's birth. Matthew says, Now the birth of Jesus was on this wise. Luke says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order the declaration of things most securely, surely believed among us, even as they declared them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministry of the word, it seemed good to me also, having a perfect understanding of all these things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Luke knew the details. John says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Yeah. The early church was not ignorant of the birth of Christ. Yet we have the Apostle Paul in this passage of Scripture saying, I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Yes. The birth of Christ is not enough, for beyond the manger is a cross. That will be both our title 
And our subject this morning, Beyond the Manger, is a cross. Before we pray, let me draw your attention briefly to verses 4 and 5. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. This needs to be true every time someone stands behind this pulpit. It's not in enticing words, but a demonstration of the power of God. And I'm asking that you would pray to that end this morning, that the Holy Spirit would use His Word to do what's necessary in this auditorium. Let's pray. Father, we have delighted to sing hymns and read Your Word concerning the birth of our Savior. We have enjoyed the celebration of His birth over the last few weeks But Lord, we come now a needy people needing to understand in a greater way things that we do not necessarily understand. And we are asking that your spirit would convict us, convince us, teach us. We want our faith to stand in your power, in the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives through your word. So Father, in these next few moments, magnify the person of the Lord Jesus in every heart here. For we ask this in the precious name of our Savior. Amen. It seems almost cruel to talk about the cross and the manger together. It's as if our minds would separate the two events like there's no connection between them. The nativity set, it's so cute, and the scene is so warm and cozy, and the birth of a baby is so heartwarming that to link it with a cross, it's so brutal and so harsh and so savage, it seems like an injustice to do so. But my friend, the wise men brought myrrh as a gift, and Simeon told Mary, the sword, a sword will pierce through your own heart also. And the angel told Joseph, before the Lord was born, Call him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. In the song we sung, I did not know we were singing that this morning, but the song we just sang, Born to Die. In the place where he lay fell a shadow cold and gray of a cross that would humble a king. My friends, beyond the manger is a cross. And until you have seen that cross, you have not understood the manger at all. Now let me caution you. Make sure that you are looking at the right cross. You say, is there more than one cross? Uh, Yes, without question, there is more than one. In our society, there are two crosses. One is merely a religious symbol. You see that everywhere. It's sold in many stores as a decoration, as a form of art, as jewelry. The Chinese, this is interesting to me, the Chinese who reject Christianity outright produce more crosses than anybody. And they sell them. They sell them in every variety you can think of. You don't work for a church, you don't see the mail that we get, but catalog after catalog comes to this church of things that are being produced with crosses that are being produced. You can buy yo-yos with a cross on the side. You can buy all kinds of toys with a, cro- with a cross. You can buy a little thing of bubble, uh, like you blow bubbles as a kid, with a cross on it. You can buy lollipops and all various forms of candy in the form of a cross. And for Easter, they sell an inflatable purple cross that has no rough edges whatsoever on it with pastel markings. It's such a nice, cute thing. My friend, this is not the cross of Christ. It is a religious symbol. And if that's what you see, there is no help there. There's nothing to be learned. There's nothing to fear. There is no offense in that cross. You can look at those crosses all day long and have no help at all. But then, my friend, there is the real cross. It's harsh. It's brutal. It's rugged. 
It's offensive. It's cruel. It's bloody. It is an instrument of death. And it's not just a merely an instrument of death. A hangman's noose and a guillotine, excuse me, and a guillotine are instruments of death. The cross is a means of prolonged, torturous death. And beyond the manger lies a cross. It's easier to shield your eyes. It's more convenient just to pack away the manger in its molded styrofoam box. It's more enjoyable to sing Christmas carols around the tree. But beyond the manger is a cross. And if we look beyond the manger at the true cross of Christ, we can be helped. One of the old hymn writers told us what we would see if we would look beyond the manger and see the cross. In a song entitled, Beneath the Cross of Jesus, Upon the cross of Jesus my eyes at times can see the very form, dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my smitten heart with tears, two wonders I confess, the wonder of His glorious love and my unrighteousness. The manger does not make these things clear, but the cross does. When we see a baby in a manger, everything is so cute and cuddly. Even our sin doesn't seem like any big deal. But when we see Jesus hanging in open shame, bleeding on a cross, that is a totally different story. For when we see that cross, we see God's true attitude towards sin. My friend, God hates sin. He's always hated sin. He will always hate sin. And the cross demonstrates that completely. Christ was not hanging there for his own crimes, but for ours. And the angel said, He shall save his people from their sin. How was this to be accomplished? By merely lying in a straw-filled manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes? No, my friend. The wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ was born as a human baby so that He could die in your place. We may take a light view of sin, but God never does. And when we look beyond the manger and see the cross, we see God's true attitude toward our sin. But it also shows love. That cross shows love. Okay, at Christmas we give gifts. And they always say, it's the thought that counts. How many have heard that? It's the thought that counts. All right, let's be honest with this. How many of you have ever had to say that about one of the gifts that you received? Let's, be, let's see. Let's be honest here. Your relatives aren't looking around to see. <laughs> How many of you have ever had that said about one of the gifts that you gave? That's a little more difficult, okay? It's the thought that counts, but that's only partially true. The amount of money that you spend on a gift is not necessarily important. What's important is its relationship to all the other gifts, the amount that you spend on all the other gifts. For instance... If I buy the neighbor a new power saw, and I give him a new power saw, and I give my wife something from the Dollar Tree, and I say, it's the thought that counts, honey. That's not going to fly, Orville. Okay? <laughs> right? It's not the thought that counts. Now, if I gave the neighbor the Dollar Tree gift, and I gave my wife the expensive power, that'd be bad too. Okay? <laughs> I'm just in trouble all the way around here. But you understand, it's the, it's the relationship. If I give my wife the more expensive gift, it doesn't matter necessarily what I give her, but my love for her will express and be expressed, and she's going to get the best gifts. You understand that. The lo people you love. I'm going to put it a different way, so it's someplace, something you can see. I was at a Christmas get-together one time, and I got a gift that was literally cost a dollar. Now, that's all well and good, no big deal there, except for everybody else that was in the same category as I was got something for $15 or $20. Now, what does that say? 
what it said was, I am obligated to give you something so I don't look bad. But I am giving you this so that you know that I don't like you. <laughs> now, you've got to admire them for their absolute honesty in the deal. It was brutal, but it was honest. Okay? What were they saying? Look, the more expensive gifts go to the people I like, the less expensive gifts go to you. Okay? The people I don't like. This is how life works, okay? It, when you're giving gifts, it, it, the gift, no matter what it costs, it's in relationship to the other gifts that you give. Sometimes you give a gift and you forget to take the price tag off. You ever done that? Oftentimes, a mom will remember, I forgot to take the gift off. And while you're unwrapping it, they're trying to peel the sticker off while you're trying to unwrap it. What are they doing? There's two reasons you want to hide that price tag. One, you don't want them to know you got it on sale, on clearance. You don't want them to know how little you spent on it. Or you spent so much on it that you really don't want them to know how much that you actually spent because it's a very expensive gift. So we try to hide the price tag. But when you look at God's gift... When you look at this gift of this child in a manger, try to calculate the cost. What is the cost of the gift of the baby in the manger? Now your mind has, is trying to come up with, okay, what is the value? What was the difficulty? What does all this mean? And the price tag, is, it kind of fluctuates in your mind. But my friend, look beyond the manger to the cross. Look beyond the baby that's so cute and cuddly that doesn't seem too bad to the brutality of the cross. And now you start to be able to calculate the expense of the gift. When you see the manger through the cross, you understand the love of God for you. You see that little baby, he's cute and cuddly, and you may not understand the love of God at that moment. But when you look through beyond the manger to the cross, you understand, wow, that is some serious love that God had for me. For he gave his son to die in my place. We get an idea of the value of God's love toward us. When we look beyond the manger to the cross, our sin is much more disgusting and God's love is much more wondrous. You know, the manger in and of itself does not have, it has very little permanent effect on us. We enjoy it. It provides a nice backdrop for the holiday. But at the end of the day, we just pack it up with the rest of the Christmas gear and go on with our lives. But beyond the manger, the manger doesn't do much to us permanently, but beyond the manger is the cross. And that cross has a permanent effect in our life. The birth of Christ was the beginning of salvation. But the cross is its completion. At the birth, the angel said, He shall save His people from his, their sin. But on the cross, Jesus said, It is finished. The manger does not affect our eternal destiny. But beyond the manger is a cross, and on that cross our sins were paid. Our place in heaven was purchased, and our eternal damnation was averted. The cross is our means of salvation. It has a permanent effect on us. But the cross does much more than that. It affects our day-to-day -day lives. For in the death and the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we have victory over sin. Sin shall not have dominion over us because of the cross. We can live moment by moment in the righteousness that the blood of Christ provides. And in his nature, we do not have to live a life dominated by sin. Another old hymn writer put it very plainly. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin a double cure, save from wrath, and make me pure. Yeah. The cross has a permanent effect in our life. The manger doesn't change us much, but beyond the manger is a cross, and in that cross we find salvation and victory 
over sin. There's another thing we must consider this morning. When you see a nativity scene, you are merely a spectator. Think about it. You get out your nativity scene and you set it up. You've got the barn and you've got the hay. You've got the cows and you've got the sheep. You've got the shepherds. Sometimes you throw in the wise men. You have Mary and Joseph. You have the, the, the manger and you have the little baby Jesus that you put in there. No matter how many times you set it up, you are still a spectator. No matter how many times you look at it, you are merely outside of the scene. You are then looking in as a spectator. The scene never changes. You merely observe it. But beyond the manger is a cross. And that is a total different story. Galatians 6.14 tells us, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. At the cross, you are no longer a spectator. It not only saves you and gives you victory over sin, but you are a participant in it. At the cross, you are crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to you. Now that means, you say, what in the world? That means that the world considers you dead and of no value. And you look at the, all the world has to offer and consider it of no value as well. Interesting, in a few moments we're going to have a baptismal service. And in the United States it does not mean a great deal like it does in other countries. But in other countries, when you get baptized, it is a whole different deal. Because you are identifying with the person of Jesus Christ. And when you identify with the person of Jesus Christ in many of those countries... Something happens. Your family, your friends, your employer, your community all throw you out. Why? Because you have identified with the person of Jesus Christ and they are crucified unto you and you are crucified unto them. You no longer have any value to them at all. They completely reject you. It happens all over the world every day. Christian, when a person trusts Christ, the world is crucified unto them, and they are crucified unto the world. But the, word, the reverse also happens to God's people. You have to understand, to God's people, people always matter. It doesn't matter to what depths of degradation, to what depths of sin a person might take themselves. They always matter to God's people because they matter to God. And God sent His Son to save them. And so people always matter to God's people. There is no unimportant person in the world as far as God's people are concerned. Because God loves them. God's people love them as well. However, when we see the true cross of Christ, we are crucified to the world. All that the world loves, all that the world values, all that the world wants to have in their life, all the, the power, all the prestige, all of the world's pleasures and its approval, all of it is crucified to us, and we no longer desire what it values. We are crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to us. You can stare at the manger scene all you want and not be changed and affected. You're always a spectator there. But when you look beyond the manger to the cross... It has an effect in your life and you are crucified to the world and the world is crucified to you. Beyond the manger is a cross. And when we look at that true cross, we see our sin clearly. We see God's great love for us. We find salvation and victory over sin and we are involved in this cross because we are crucified to the world and the world is crucified to us. The question is, have you looked beyond the manger? For beyond the manger is a cross. Let's pray.